For Criminal Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Madiba, Senior Lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Pretoria and author Tula Simpson joins me to unpack his book titled History of South Africa from 1902 to the Present. Your book covers 12 historical decades from the surrender of the Boer fightings in the Second Anglo-Boer War in 1902 to the July 2021 unrest, which took place in South Africa. So can you briefly talk to us about the research process involved in putting this book together? The research built on my previous research on Mkuntu Esizwe because that when I was writing that book, I was limited to the ANC's armed struggle, but the research convinced me that there was a lot more detail there in the archives about the origins of the present day South Africa and also numerous parallel processes in the past. So I had a platform there and I knew that the project was achievable. Also in the mid 2010s, there was the discernible beginning of a process which we're still living in. It's part of the same process of an accumulation of political, economic and social stress in the country. So I felt that the need for such a book would grow and rise um, with time. And what I wanted to do was to return to those sources and explore other sources on the basis of the questions which were being raised by the present juncture. What I mean by that, and I need to explain it better, is in the present, in the second decade of the 21st century, we have a clearer idea of what the greatest longer term consequences of past events were. So that gives you new questions with which to go to old archives and reinterpret what is important about them. And why do you think it is important for South Africans to know more about the country's history? And do you think young people care about this history? Well, for the largest part of the post-apartheid era, there was a sense that the, what, what is the need for South African history? We know what we need to do going forward to overcome the wounds of the past. And I think that in that context, there would have been a general questioning about whether a new history of South Africa was important or needed. But I think that that process which I discussed in my previous answer, which is the expansion of these challenges which are not being solved in the present, opens the question about whether we've got the right examples from the past and we're taking the right lessons from them. And that's what I was referring to in my previous answer with regards to these new questions with which to go to old archives and think about reinterpreting the past and coming up with a new synthesis. So I think what we've had demonstrated is in South Africa is that the countries know exception to a universal pattern, which is that there's no end of history, there's always new questions emerging and always the need for a reinterpretation of the past, what is important about the past and which episodes we should look to. And you start your book from 1902. What is your view on the impact of the Second Anglo-Boer War from 1899 to 1902 in the making of the modern South Africa? The uh, Anglo-Boer War is the catalyst for a shift where South Africa, which for almost a century had been basically a geographical expression, it becomes a concrete name for a political entity. It's a colonial creation, not a nation at all, as some people will remind us, but it does become a single unit. And what I wanted to do is to describe the development of that unit, not just politically, but also socially, economically, culturally, over the decades that follow. And I wanted to explore the history of what we refer to as South Africa, which is the Republic of South Africa that we know and we live under to the present day. And there are some interesting points covered in your book, such as the history of the Jewish migration into South Africa in the early years of the 20th century and the 1930 Quota Act, which sought to deny Eastern European Jewish entry to the country. Can you tell us more about this? Yes, I mean, um, that was a perceived problem amongst the right-wing National Party at the time, viewing the Jewish population as being a threat to South Africa. It shows how these interpretations can change over time. I mean, just a few years before that, it, there was the view of the Chinese as being a threat. Now, looking from the perspective of the 21st century, almost certainly these would have been very productive and valuable citizens. It's a sort of caution against excessive levels of xenophobia, which has been a perennial factor in South African history. In certain sources, there are re references to South Africa being in many respects the most xenophobic uh, member 
anti-Semitic member of the um, what was known at the time as the uh, British Commonwealth. So there's an, an attempt to keep the Jews out, to limit them. The discourse about Jewish migrants um, is very similar to uh, the discourse which was earlier used against the Chinese, but also to the present day is used against African migrants from the continent itself. And um, if you look at how the Jews of South Africa flourished subsequently, it's uh, interesting and important episode in a longer term uh, engagement that we've had in South Africa. And South Africa's turbulent history includes events such as the 1922 rent revolt, the 1950s defiant campaign, the Sharpeville massacre in the early 1960s, the Soweto uprising of the 1970s and the Marikana massacre of 2012. So do you think South Africa is doomed to continue to have such bloodshed and conflict? I don't think so. I don't think that the bloodshed and conflict follows a similar pattern. I mean, there's some wars which were um, conflicts of colonization, others which were conflicts of liberation. So the axis always shifts. Yes, it has been a very violent history, but it's less violent in many ways than um, it was in the past and in comparison with other societies as well. So the focus will always shift and conflicts will always Um, assume a different function in the society and there'll be new issues that will arise but that's the same for every single um, society and during the month of july 2021 unrest broke out and swept through the country especially in gauteng and kwazulu natal in your view how do you characterize this episode was it an uprising a riot or a coup attempt i don't think it was a coup attempt i think it was an attempt to um, shift the internal power balance within the anc's nec and it dovetailed and it exploited a combustible mix which had existed in the country as a result of that accumulation of social and economic stress, which I'd spoken about, a long-term contraction in people's prospects, reflected in the statistics which we've had this week with the unemployment uh, rate and the lack of growth in the economy. So that creates a social and economic context in which what is an internal uh, factional dispute within the ruling party can spill out into the streets and you can have this mass uh, insurrectionary moment. I think that the organizers themselves in many ways were um, shocked and surprised by the Weltfire effect which their instigation had. So, for example, you had the worst day of the conflict on the um, 12th um, of July, but by the 13th of July, if you follow these Facebook posts and WhatsApp messages, people are saying we need to rein this back because it's had a much more devastating effect than we expected when the um, process became a generalized free-for-all. So while it wasn't a coup d'etat, I mean, you know, if you're going for a coup d'etat, there's choices you make about which direction you pursue. Do you go to the shopping mall or do you go to the center of administrative power? And people consistently went to the shopping mall. That was the way of affecting this internal power struggle. So it wasn't a coup d'etat, but it did show how vulnerable the state security forces were if the decision had been to go in the opposite direction and to try and seize power because the state security forces were paralyzed in that moment. And in South Africa, COVID-19 has exposed greed and corruption Comparing COVID-19 to the Spanish flu of a century ago and the AIDS pandemic in more recent years, what impact do you think the coronavirus pandemic will have on the country? I think that the um, course of those other pandemics was different in important ways. The um, second wave of the Spanish flu ripped through South Africa and it paralyzed the government's ability to respond. Uh, For the coronavirus, there was a certain buildup where the virus spread around the world and there was possibilities to prepare a response. And it's progressed over a much longer period of time with fortunately much less lethal consequences uh, in the short term. HIV AIDS is not as easily transmissible. In other words, you need to commit a conscious act in order to transmit the virus. And so that limits the capacity to spread. But in all of these, it shows that disease has the capacity to alter human history in profound and important ways. And that's an important message for us historians. For the largest part of the 20th century, I think, following on in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, the focus of South African historiography had been to trace the consequences of social and economic factors in history. Uh, That was the basis of the liberal and radical interpretations of South African history. But I think that what we've seen um, highlighted in an indisputable way as a result of the COVID-19 crisis is that um, public health is a fundamental factor in shaping human society. And lastly... What needs to be done to put South Africa onto an 
inclusive economic growth path that will help to build a better life for all. I think that um, this is one of the messages of my book, which is that if you go back and 120 years is just a nanosecond in the long evolution of human history, but even within that framework, there are similar parallels where the government and even within the ANC's rule, it's faced with a bankrupt treasury and a growing sense of pessimism about the future of the country. That was the condition that the ANC inherited in the 1990s. Within a decade, uh, we had um, the longest economic expansion in the country's history and a spread of hope within the country. Tough decisions were made at the time, which the ANC, in terms of its internal uh, evolution, decided to turn its back on. I do think that economic reconstruction and recovery will follow along similar lines. Yes, it's true, as the critique of those decisions um, said at the time, that not all legacies of the past were resolved within that 10-year framework. Under what circumstances were all the legacies of the past going to be resolved within 10 years of the ANC coming to power? What we had during those years was the most determined assault in South African history against that legacy of poverty um, and inequality. And the steps which the ANC will need to take against its own record this time, not the National Party's record, but the, its own record since the 2000s, will involve setting South Africa back on a growth-oriented path. And um, I do believe that there will come a point in which there's no alternative to that. There's far too many restrictions on economic activity at the moment, um, cruel restrictions with regards to work seekers, res- preventing them from going out and trying to access uh, employment and restrictions on employers which are amount to an unnecessary assault on the country's productive capacity. A lot of those restrictions will have to be released in order to get the country growing again and to get the country growing in a more um, labor absorptive direction. So that's a central dispute which has um, emerged in the post-apartheid era. The ANC decided to take one fork in the road um, in the uh, first decade of the 21st century. A lot of those decisions will simply have to be reversed in order to get South Africa back on a growth trajectory. That was Tula Simpson speaking to Krima Media's Polity about history of South Africa.